So Wells asked the great question at the end, all good questions. Questions are loud. All questions are loud, right? He asked, what would it, the world be like without God? I guess we could say, well, we wouldn't be here, right? Ultimately, cause and effect, the uncaused cause. Why is there something instead of nothing has been the philosophical question through the ages. And let me ask you this question. If Easter Resurrection Sunday never took place, how would it change your life? How would it change your daily life, how you live your life? That's a question worth pondering. And we're going to ask some questions today because I want to talk about something that is all over the Easter story. It hovers all over the text, but we rarely talk about it. I want to talk about doubt and unbelief on Easter Sunday. Because you know this, the first person, the first response to the empty tomb was not one of faith and excitement and all of that. In fact, Mary Magdalene was the one. She was the first person to ever see the empty tomb. And the Bible tells us that when she saw the empty tomb in John 20, in fact, that's where we're going to be. If you have your Bible, you can turn to John 20. Okay. She's one of his most committed, closest followers. And she sees the empty tomb and then she runs to tell the disciples about it. And here's what she says. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. Now imagine this. I mean, we would have responded the same way, right? No one anticipated the resurrection. This is complete diversion from Jewish theology. And so she's thinking dead bodies don't move on their own. Someone stole her body. Really what's happening is she's thinking this. I watched him die. I watched them beat him. I watched them crucify him. I was right there. I saw it. And now this? Are you kidding me? When are they going to let him go? When are they going to leave this nightmare of mine alone? Now they've taken his body. She runs and tells the disciples. And then John tells us that he and Peter run to the tomb. And I love how he parenthetically adds the younger John outran Peter to the tomb. He says that. I love that. They're like, I'm the first to be there. No, no, no. Guys, listen. No, the women beat you to the tomb, Okay. The women were there first. The women went to care for Jesus early that morning. And when they went there, listen, the first response was, was one of terror, I mean, distress, confusion. No one saw this coming. And so then she goes back to the disciples after she encounters Jesus. And she encounters him thinking he's the gardener, right? We would have done the same, probably still dark. She's not expecting Jesus to be alive, then he says her name. When Jesus says your name, that's when your eyes are open. And so Mary Magdalene, then it says, went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. This is the first person to ever say Jesus is risen. With millions, billions of people worshiping the Lord all over the planet today and throughout history, she's the first one. Mary goes to them, and we know this. She says, uh, then she tells him, and I had this conversation with him. And when Mary and the other women told the disciples that they'd seen him, they responded with, y'all are crazy. That was their first response, right? You're crazy. And then, then there's Thomas. Now, many of us know Thomas's story. We see in John 20, 19, it says that Sunday night, so tonight, Jesus appears to the disciples. They're in a locked room and Jesus shows up and he appears to them. They're hiding out for fear of the Jews, it says. They're thinking, they're coming after us next, right? And then it says, now Thomas, verse 24, one of the 12 called the twin, that was his nickname, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, most of us know Thomas by this one incident. We've given him another nickname, haven't we? He was called Twin because he's a twin. We call him what? Doubting Thomas. And I'm going to state the case today. It's completely inaccurate. Totally a misnomer. Thomas is not as much a doubter as he is a realist. Because it says then that, that uh, he then in verse 25, so the other disciples told him, look at this, we've seen the Lord. 
They go and tell him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, hey, unless I see his, his, his hands, the mark of nails, place my finger inside, unless I touch him, unless I touch him, I will never believe. You catch that? Never believe. I want to make the case today that Thomas is all of our twin. He's the twin of every one of us. Thomas is not a doubter. He's a realist. He wants, he wants evidence. Who doesn't want evidence, right? All of us want evidence. He wants to experience Christ on his own. That's what's happening here. Not, not his friends, not, not his, watch this, not his mama's faith, his daddy's faith, somebody else's experience. I want to see him myself. And I think every one of us are here today and we want to see him for ourselves. But what's really going on here? What's really happening? Let's get underneath this. Thomas's hopes have been shattered. His entire future story has been crushed. Why was he not with the disciples earlier? We don't know, but I got a hunch. I think he is out. I think he's done. I think he is so destroyed by the disappointment of what he thought was coming. He can't handle it, right? I think he's saying, guys, no, 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 no. Do not come at me with this. I have been hurt already. I've been crushed. I will not believe. Never will I believe. I will not let my heart go out there again. And then here's what happens, though. We know that he is actually, he was actually fully committed to Jesus. You may not know in John 11, okay, there's a story before this where it says in verse 16, so Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas was ready to die with Jesus. This is where Jesus says, hey, Lazarus is dying. I'm going back to Judea. And the disciples say to him, uh, are you, remember last time we were there? Like they tried to stone you. Remember, you're like, we were trying to kill us. Do you remember that? And Jesus says, yeah, let's go. I'm going. And Thomas, the one, Thomas says, I'm in. Let's go die with him. He was ready. He was all in. So what happened? His story got hijacked. All that he anticipated was destroyed. He's thinking, wasn't he going to bring about the revolution? Was he lying to us? What is going on here? I will not put my heart out there again. Not going to happen. And what I want to do today, friends, listen. And I want you to do this in the days to come and throughout your life. I want to reframe doubt as deconstruction. There's a lot of deconstruction going on in our day. A lot of unhealthy deconstruction without truth. There's deconstruction that leads to belief and greater commitment. There's deconstruction that can be really unhealthy. We've all constructed our faith. Every one of us here, our children are constructing their faith based on what they're seeing and what they're learning. We've all constructed our faith. We need to, many of us, all of us probably, deconstruct our faith and reconstruct it according to the truth, not according to what we've made up in our minds. Doubt often comes, think about it, when you go through loss, grief, and disappointment. And how disappointing has this year been? How much loss, how much grief, how much sorrow? And many of us are here today, and I want to trust him, but I don't know. I can't, I can't put my heart out there again. And we've all been there, right? This is me in the eighth grade asking a girl to go with me. I don't know where we're going, but we're going to go together. And, and then I'm thinking we're going we're to get married and, and this will end happily ever after she breaks up with me. Boom. Story changed. It's the person who thought, how about this? The kids who thought their parents were perfect. Boom. It's the spouse who thought their spouse was going to be faithful all the way through to the end. It's the person who had the perfect job, the dream job, and then they let you go. You start to wonder, God, are you even, do you even exist? It's the person who enters into retirement, a long, happy retirement that's disrupted by a terminal diagnosis. Doubt often comes after disappointment and grief. But listen, friends, we've got to realize that really what's going on for many of us, we were the ones with the story. It was our future story, not God's. It was our story that got disrupted. We were the ones calling the shots. We were the ones who had determined out uh, what our plan would be, what our life would be. We had become the hero, the God of our own story, not God. 
So how do we process all this? I want you to hear me clearly. Doubt is a normal process of faith. So if you doubt, if you got questions, uh, we, we know that this is a normal process of faith. But here's, my, here's how I say it. Doubt is to unbelief as temptation is to sin. Think about it. You're going to be tempted. Don't let your temptation become sin. Here's what many of us do. We're tempted and we think, next step, I'm being tempted, next step, sin. Here I go. No. Temptation leads to obedience, which leads to greater faith, greater commitment. In the same way, don't let your doubt become unbelief. How does this happen? Deconstruct your doubts. All right. Thomas shows us three practical steps here toward greater faith. The first one is doubt your doubts. Doubt your doubts. When you start to doubt, don't just go there. Okay. Don't let it become unbelief. Face it head on. See, many people, here's the problem. Many of us think that belief in God is all about faith. Kierkegaard called it a leap in the dark. And then we think that not believing in God, well, that's all about rational thinking and intellect and being logical. No, 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 no. It takes faith and reason to believe in God. That's how he's created us. And it takes, watch this, faith and reason to, to not believe in God. The question comes down for me, which takes more faith? It's why Norman Geisler wrote the book entitled, it takes, you no, know, he says, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist was the name of the book. And he's not throwing shade. He's saying, I've tested the evidence. And friends, I've done the same. It takes a lot more faith not to believe in God than it does to believe in him. It takes a lot more faith to not believe in the resurrection. When you address the facts and come up with reason. How about this? Anselm of Canterbury. He was the archbishop of Canterbury. He said this. He said that belief precedes understanding. And we hate this. If we're honest. Faith precedes reason. In other words, you come to him in faith, by faith today. What many of you have hesitated and you need to come to him and then all of a sudden you see more. He reveals more. There's revelation that comes when we take the step of faith. That's the way it works. And though faith makes us crazy, praise God it's faith and not your works. You can't be smart enough to get to God. Some of us need to just surrender and say, I believe. Because here's the thing, friends. You don't need a God that, can, that you can put in a box of your own understanding. That's what many of us are doing. You don't need a genie in a bottle. You need God. And if your God never calls you out, if your God never, you know, points out sin and tells you to live differently, you're not worshiping God. You're worshiping something else. You know, you're worshiping yourself. You're calling the shots. How about this? Doubt is to challenge us so that ultimately God can destroy our idols because your idols, your false gods will always, always let you down. Listen, doubt it's the grace of God to allow us to rethink what we really believe. You've got to doubt your doubts. Secondly, look at this, distinguish your doubts. Distinguish your doubts from something else that's really going on. I mean, let's get serious. Let's think deeply about our doubts. See, real doubt can be healthy, even helpful, right? Like Thomas, doubt often follows disappointment. But here it is, listen. Doubt also comes when we've re when we constructed a God from others around us that is not the God of the Bible. I was speaking to a group of, of students at a youth camp about this, about a crowd this size. And afterwards, a boy comes up to me afterwards and he's a, he's a you know, football playing jock. He's all kind of bowed up and he's got a lot of questions. And so we sit down and start talking and he's asking, Jeff, how can you talk about a God who is loving with all the suffering in the world? And the more he started to ask questions, the angrier he got. And I'm like, there's a story here. I mean, he's, he's like enraged. So I'm listening to him. He finally, we calm down, just listen to his story, just lovingly listening. And then I ask him a question. Tell me about your relationship with your dad. Quickly, his rage turned into tears. And this big, strong football player is weeping. And he says, hey, Jeff, you know, most people think that I work out because of football. My dad thinks I work out. I'm in the gym all the time. I'm working out so I can get bigger and stronger than him. So he'll stop coming at me. 
the transference of father to father, you see? He needed to distinguish his doubts from what reality was. Many of us need to do that. I was speaking to a group in Africa. This gal comes up to me afterwards, 16 years old, and I've shared this story before. She, she's a missionary kid. She tells me she's an MK, and we're alone talking, and, and she says, Jeff, this, this Jesus, this grace of God, loving Jesus, she said, Jesus is an evil person to me. Okay, let's talk about this. She went on to say that her missionary father goes out, tell people about Jesus, comes home. And their home life is completely different than what she is told it ought to be. Dark story. And she then, both of these, came to understand, listen, this is not the God that we're calling you to. And friends, a lot of us hear this, these stories, not all of us, but a lot of us hear this story today and we say, that is crazy. I mean, that's extreme stuff, but we all can see that, that it just shows us that we've created God in our own image based on our own personal experience. And what's happened to Thomas is completely destroyed, completely let down. The transference of the father to father creates doubt in us and no wonder it does and here's the thing i'm going to say this i thought today would be a good day i'm going to go there many of you have been hurt by the church and when i say church we mean like a person or people who've let you down i mean likely as pastor a lot of i, I likely i've let you down but i want to i want to say this we all you see most of what we've come to believe comes from our family of origin but we all, most of us, have a faith family of origin as well. And I want to ask you, what did they get wrong? What was passed on to you that was not according to Scripture and who God really is and who Jesus is? Did they get it all right? Did you, did you fully understand you got it all right? Listen, here's what's important. To some degree, we all need to deconstruct our faith. But we've got to do it according to truth. And I want to say this, anyone who's been disappointed or hurt by the church, it was C.S. Lewis who said, the abuse, the abuse of a thing never nullifies its original use. Don't let others, a misre misrepresentation of Jesus, you know, who misrepresent Christ as Christians, don't let them nullify the original call and beauty of the gospel. We must all return to the original call as healing agents in the world. Henry Nouwen said it this way, the church will never cease to stand in the way of God, but she will always be the way to God. And I, I, I want to say this to all of our guests. Our members know this. We are not a perfect church. You don't have a perfect pastor, so I blow that out of the water right away. But we are, how about this, an imperfect people humbly and lovingly together want to point you to a perfect Savior. We have a perfect God, a perfect Savior who loves you perfectly. Whatever experience you've had, we want you to know him. We want you to come to him. But like Thomas, we've got to see for ourselves, right? So here's what happens in verse 26, eight days later, okay? His disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then I love this. Verse 27, he addresses Thomas. He says, hey, put your finger here. See my hands, put out your hands, place it in my side. He says, touch me. And, and watch this. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Believe. Doubt your doubts distinguish your doubts and finally disable your doubts dispel your doubts disarm your doubts how does this happen how can we disarm our doubts first of all listen it's got to happen in community this is why this has been so difficult this year some of us are living as lone ranger christians and check it out even the lone ranger wasn't okay figure that out over lunch okay you're gonna talk about that look God wants us to do this together. Thomas got in trouble when he went out on his own. 
We've got to process our faith and live our faith, encourage each other together. That's the first step. And secondly, I've said it already, you've got to deconstruct, reconstruct your faith according to his word, not a million lies that you're hearing every single day. And many of us are not in the word. No wonder you're doubting. You're not with other believers. And it's been hard this year, but we're opening up. You're going to hear more about what's happening. We've got to come back together. But you can connect with other believers. You've got to do this. You can't do this alone. So Jesus says, touch me, man. I'm here. I'm I'm for real. And Thomas answered him and he said, my Lord and my God. And he worships him. And I know you're thinking like me. I read the text and I go, if I was there, I'd believe too. If I could touch him, Jesus will not let you go. He won't let you get off that easily. He says in verse 29, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus brings his challenge to the disciples right here to this place, 3933 Northwest Parkway right here into your heart today. And the spirit of God is asking Do you believe? Do you believe? Do you trust him? Friends, listen, take it from me. There are answers to your questions. My life has been a pursuit of answers to questions. And there are barriers to faith that can be broken down, but you've got to do it in community. I'm challenging you today, on this day, to join the fellowship of our church. I'm challenging you first to receive Christ. Because listen, there's coming a day this, you need to know that this is a process, a cycle of process. Where are you in this? Construction, re- deconstruction, reconstruction. It's a process. Because the final reconstruction is when we get to heaven. You talk about a total deconstruction. And now when we see him face to face, we go, yes, now it makes sense. The redemption of all things is the complete reconstruction of all that is broken. And you'll see him face to face. And you will know if you receive his grace. He died on the cross for you. He paid the price for your sin. That you might come to him and believe. So there's a really interesting story. I'll close with this. That we see another post-resurrection event where Jesus is with his disciples. He's about to descend to heaven. And it says in Matthew 27. Now the 11 disciples. Think about it. Thomas among them went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them and when they saw him they worshipped him but some doubted what can we worship God in our doubt you bet you can now I need to make a distinction here that word that we translate doubt there is not the normal New Testament word for doubt it's a word distazo, which actually means uh, they were hesitant. Anybody ever hesitant? Some of y'all came this morning. Come on. Hesitant. I don't know about this. I don't know. Some people seem excited. I'm not so sure. Friend, if you're there, I challenge you. Today is the day. Today is the day. Believe precedes understanding. Cross that line of faith today. Do you believe? We all need to come before the Lord, many of you today, all of us, in varying degrees, and pray the prayer that the man prayed of Jesus. I believe, but help me with my unbelief. If you'll come to him like that, the Lord will say, yes, come. Come on, let's go. Now, what happened to Thomas? Anybody know? Thomas goes on to India. Many of us have been to India. There's a group of Christians in southern India called St. Thomas Christians. You know why? Because doubters become the best missionaries. Doubters deconstruct their faith. They reconstruct their faith based on a personal encounter with Jesus. And they go and tell others about what they've experienced, how he's changed their lives. And this is the call on every one of us. Our world, our nation is in desperate need right now of a Savior. And we know him. 
and we can share with the world what we know, friends. Do you believe? I'm going to ask you the question. I want us to do this. I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads, everybody right where you are. Close your eyes. And I want to ask you the question. I want you to answer out loud. If you believe, I want you to say, I believe. I want to ask you, and I want you to proclaim it. Do you believe? I believe. And friend, if you're here and you you can't say that you believe or you were brought here or you're watching me online and you're still processing, keep on processing. But there's coming a moment where you've got to decide to take a step of faith. Today is your day. That's why the Lord brought you here. So you can say yes to him. Yes, by faith. Praise him. It's by faith. You don't have to do anything. It's a free gift of God to say yes to him. Give him your life. And determine today that you will commit yourself to his church. That you'll do something. That you'll act. Come back to community. Come back to his word. Lord Jesus, we give you our lives. We praise you that you take our doubts. Turn it into faith. Lord, we will continue to doubt our doubts. We, Lord, will distinguish our doubts and we will disable our doubts as we walk with you every single day. You are our risen King. We believe you are risen and we praise you. In your name we pray. And everyone said, amen.